Thereafter, there will be more ambitious, more elaborate space station with plenty of science, with plenty of equipment, with lots of very interesting things to do. In a way, there's a lot more meat for engineers and scientists in this assignment than there ever was in the business of building big boosters. Well, Skylab's going to be uh, America's first space station as such. We're going to be up there roughly eight months. We're going to visit it three times during this eight months. And we're going to find out a lot about how to live in a space station, what we can do there. Of course, Apollo went on to take us to the moon, but it also left us with a tremendous technology to look towards the future. And as far as Skylab is concerned, it represents a definite turning point. Well, the Skylab was an interim program because we knew we were going to make a bigger space station eventually. We want to go to Mars and do the other things. So we had to uh, learn a lot more about zero gravity and how to live and work in space on a routine basis rather than just uh, like a 10-day adventure. Born out of the imagination of Dr. Werner von Braun, Skylab was America's first space station, an extension of the Apollo program. Skylab's initial proposal came about in 1964, when NASA began looking into other scientific missions that could be embarked upon using the Apollo hardware. In November of that year, Dr. Von Braun submitted his proposal for an American space station that would be launched into low Earth orbit using an unmanned Saturn V rocket. Soon thereafter, work began at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama to make Skylab a reality. Marshall Space Flight Center is the one that's responsible for the Skylab program. Dr. Von Braun and a few others came up with that idea and they sketched out a little drawing and the people here were so enthusiastic about it, they really built a great space station. All of us who worked on Skylab, this is our second home for about three years. By 1971, development on Skylab was well underway when the United States suffered another blow in the ongoing space race with the Soviet Union. While the United States had managed to win the race to the moon, the Soviet Union launched and established the first space station with Salyut. Undeterred, NASA completed work on Skylab. On May 14, 1973, Skylab launched from Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral, Florida, with the first crew set to launch the next day on the 15th. But troubles arose during Skylab's launch that would delay the launch of the first crew by 10 days and possibly cast doubt on any manned missions to the station. Of course, as soon as we could listen in on the flight director net, we realized something had happened to the lab, even though it looked like a perfect launch from where we had been observing it. Very soon after launch, it was obvious that we had lost part or all of the shield around the orbital workshop. With the gold foil exposed directly to the sun's rays, the temperature inside the orbital workshop, in the areas you can see here, was increasing rapidly. We had to move fast to keep the workshop from becoming uninhabitable. The next job was to find repair methods so that we could save the full mission. We went to Marshall to work in the water tank with the proposed fixes, talk to the engineers who were working on it, talk to the flight planners, and discuss it, of course, with management. And we actually launched on the 25th of May with three potential ways of covering the workshop to shade it from the sun. Once onboard Skylab, the astronauts deployed a parasol-like sunshade through a small instrument port, successfully dropping the temperature inside. While the workshop was now habitable, Skylab was still in need of further repairs to ensure the vitality of future missions. During Skylab's launch, the station had lost one of its two solar array panels with the other panel getting jammed and not deploying. Without power from the jammed panel, the second and third Skylab missions would not have enough power to perform their main experiments. Astronauts Pete Conrad and Joe Kerwin had practiced the extravehicular solar array repair in Marshall's neutral buoyancy simulator before launch. Two weeks into the 28-day mission, Conrad and Kerwin suited up and embarked upon the daring spacewalk to unjam the stuck panel. When they finally managed to deploy the panel, the sudden movement threw both Conrad and Kerwin from the station's hull, with their tethers being the only thing keeping them from floating off into space. The astronauts were able to regain their composure and make their way back to Skylab, successfully completing the repair. I think we probably wouldn't have had any Skylab missions had it not been for the fact that man was able to get to the Skylab and to make it habitable and to repair it in such a way that all of the missions were completely successful. That's where you need man. You need man up there when you need some freewheeling judgment. And the tasks in space that uh, should be assigned to man are the tasks that require him to use his mind and his abilities, his unique abilities, which uh, certainly can't be covered by programming a computer. 
Hundreds of people, both in industry and government, work together as a close-knit, well-integrated team to come up with solutions to save our stranded ship, the Skylab, 270 miles above Earth. But the results were both heartwarming and very beneficial to our total efforts in space, showing what man on the ground, working with men in space, can do. With Skylab stabilized, the astronauts were now able to begin their planned scientific experiments, which included experiments using the attached Apollo Telescope Mount Solar Observatory. In total, there were three manned Skylab missions between May and November of 1973, with nine different astronauts occupying the station at separate intervals. We had 60 scientific experiments, and uh, they were primarily around the first the study of the sun. We don't get all the information that comes from the sun on our telescopes on the ground because a lot of information is absorbed in the atmosphere. But up above the atmosphere, we can get 100% of the information. We're also uh, trying to understand uh, how to manage our resources on Earth. So uh, going around the world every hour and a half, you cover a lot of ground in a hurry. The Skylab medical experiments were perhaps one of the most important things we did uh, during the whole Skylab mission. We attempted to take a look at man as he reacted under long-term weightlessness. Whether or not we can extrapolate that um, 84 days out to several hundred days. Incidentally, it takes something like 400 days for a typical Mars mission. Uh, we don't know right now. But it does indicate that uh, we're on the right way to assuming that man can exist for long times at zero G. One of the more unique experiments that occurred aboard Skylab were the spiders Anita and Arabella, two common cross spiders that flew on the Skylab 3 mission as part of a student research experiment orchestrated through Marshall Space Flight Center to study web formations in zero gravity. They very quickly adjusted and adapted to a weightless environment, and, and uh, uh, the, the way they spun their web was to be, walk around the edge and attach it again, walk around the edge and attach it again. On February 8, 1974, the final Skylab crew returned to Earth. Okay, we're undocked. Uh, I'd say goodbye for you. She's going to get burned. Roger, sure have. While initial plans were to have the station in orbit for another 8 to 10 years and possibly be revisited by the space shuttle fleet, unexpected high solar activity caused the station to deorbit early. On the 11th of July in 1979, Skylab re-entered Earth's atmosphere and disintegrated, sending debris down in the Indian Ocean and over a sparsely populated portion of Western Australia. In terms of what Skylab meant for the future, well certainly it was a prelude to the International Space Station which is doing great things. And if we want to go back to the moon, or on to Mars in particular, we need to understand what happens to the human body. And we, we were the precursors to getting all that initial understanding and know what questions to ask. It verified the fact that people could live, work, do productive things for long durations, and then it also took the first steps into the uh, science that we also wanted to have on board. We just took the first step, and the rest of the steps have been taken and are being taken right now. While Skylab was short-lived, its legacy lives on in museums like Huntsville, Alabama's U.S. Space and Rocket Center, where the triumphs of the program are remembered and shared every day. Would you like to see the inside of Skylab, where the astronauts lived and worked? This is really important. Not so much that the details of Skylab are out there, but when kids come through here, they see it's real, and they get enthused. And you don't really see the, the major impact then, but you, you just change the course of their life a little bit. 10 years downstream, they may be doing something really good in that field and encourages them to get a good education. So just these types of things, uh, which kids don't normally see, is, is, is a great motivator for kids. Well, this brings back good memories. Yeah, yeah, it was a good time.